Um, let me uh, spend a few minutes uh, covering a little bit more on SQL today and I may cover a little bit more of this missing material later on. Uh, but before I start on that, uh, today's lab consists of setting up PostgreSQL and doing a bunch of stuff on that. Um, so, I will after maybe uh, less than half an hour of uh, other stuff, I will get into the lab material itself. You have handouts, if maybe some of you may have already read that and figured out what is happening. If not, we will talk about it uh, after covering up a bit on SQL. Shall we get started? Everyone ready? So, this uh, last chapter on SQL, it is called advanced SQL. It has several topics. I am not actually going to cover all of those. Uh, we do not have time for it. Uh, we would not cover it all here in this uh, version. However, in December, when we have about twice as many lectures as we have in this one week course, I will be covering some of these topics in more detail. So, at this point, I will just flash the topics by you. So, you know, you can uh, read it up uh, on your own and get familiar with it if you are already not aware about it. So, the first topic which we will be covering now is um, accessing SQL from a programming language, in particular using JDBC. The other stuff I will only give you an introduction. So, um, how many of you have used JDBC specifically? Let us take a quick poll. We did this poll online, but let us redo it. How many of you have used either JDBC or ODBC or any other equivalent API to connect to a database from a programming language? Let me reverse those. How many of you have not used any API to connect to a database? A few of you. Okay. So, then I will uh, spend a little bit of motivation for these APIs before getting into details. Uh, let me also ask one more question. How many of you have used uh, Java? have done any programming in Java and flipping that question, how many of you have not done any Java programming? A few. Okay. Today's lab and tomorrow's lab are purely SQL based. Uh, the lab on uh, you know, day after tomorrow is using Java and using Eclipse. Uh, I do not know how much free time you have, uh, but if, if you have access to resources on Java. Um, be good if you, those of you who are not familiar with Java, please read up the very basics of Java. It is not a big deal. If you know C, I assume everyone knows C. So, Java is close enough with some minor changes. So, I think you will manage fine, but if you have time uh, and can browse uh, some of the Java tutorials online, that would be good. Okay. Now, let us uh, get back to JDBC. The idea is we want to uh, build an application we cannot write it completely in SQL. It has to be written in some other language and SQL is merely the language to access data. So, the question is how can you communicate with a database from a programming language and for that basically you need to define an API and the standard APIs which are used today, uh, there are several standards depending on the language. For Java, it is JDBC. For C, C++, uh, it is ODBC. And for the .NET languages, there are uh, variants, uh, ADO.NET, uh, the Microsoft land. Um, and uh, then for uh, scripting languages like uh, PHP and so on, uh, there are again APIs of their own, which are basically a layer on top of ODBC. JDBC, ODBC are fairly similar in terms of the features. So, we will see what are the features. So, the main steps in an application talking to a database, the first is to connect to the database and identify who you are to the database, that this application has the authorization to use features on this database. Now, how do you do that? Uh, the standard way is to give a login password for the application to identify itself. This has some security uh, loopholes because the login password is stored in the application code. If somebody gets access to that code, they can get access to the database. Um, but Although other uh, approaches for authenticating an application to the database have been proposed, none of those are practical as of today. So, this is basically what we need to use. Um, you can do a little bit more with certificates and so on, but it basically comes to the same thing. The next step is uh, to send SQL commands and get results back. 
and since results are usually a set of tuples, we need a way to iterate over the tuples in a result. Again, there are different architectural approaches used by different APIs. We will see what JDBC does, uh, which is you can fetch tuples of the result one by one and process them one by one. So, we have already uh, seen um, what is this, the motivation. Now, in addition to the basic things of sending a query and getting results back, JDBC also supports uh, several other features. In particular, um, one of the nice things it supports is metadata retrieval. Again, this was, was already there in ODBC and JDBC came later. But this is a very powerful feature which lets you, when you run a query, the query is a string as far as your application is concerned. But you can submit a query and use the metadata features to talk to the database and find out how many columns does the query result have, how many columns does this table in the database have and so on. So, you can get metadata type information about both database relations and query results which lets you build generic interfaces where you type in any query, the system can run it and show you the result of that query in a nice tabular fashion with the proper typing and so on. So, that is another important feature of JDBC, which we will look at only briefly. We won't cover it in the lab, but you can look at this in more detail offline. Okay. So, how do you communicate with the database in specifically in JDBC? We open a connection, then we have to create a statement object, which basically is like an encapsulation of an SQL query and then we uh, execute state queries using the statement object, fetch results and then there is a whole exception mechanism. Um, yeah. So, here is how you set up the connection. This is a, a method somewhere in some class and we are not shown the enclosing class, but of course, in Java all of this has to be part of a class. So, what this particular method does is it takes a database identifier, a user identifier and a password and then does a whole bunch of stuff in here. What is the first thing it does here? It says class dot for name. This one is Oracle specific. In the lab, you will be using the PostgreSQL version of this. So, these uh, things will change a little bit, uh, but the first step it does is it is loading a driver in this case for Oracle. Now, what is this loading of a driver? Uh, to understand this, you have to understand how JDBC is architected. Now, there are two possible approaches to connecting to a database. One is that the database says, here is a network protocol. You send me these bytes, I will interpret it thus and I will give you back results. That is not how JDBC or ODBC work. How they work is that um, it is purely an API. What exactly goes across the network to the database and comes back is not part of the JDBC protocol specification. It, the protocol only specifies the API, which means you need some code uh, a library to run on the client machine, which actually communicates with a corresponding uh, set of functions on the database server side. So, on both sides you have code and your program has to link to the client code, which will actually talk to the database. And for each database, you have different client code. So, in this case, um, we are getting the uh, Oracle driver. In your assignment, you will use the PostgreSQL drivers. Uh, now, this um, each of these databases has its own set of client libraries. So, one way is uh, if you are using C, for example, uh, in, in the Unix world, traditional world, you would link it statically. So, for this application, I am going to link to the Oracle library, but this does not work that way. Here, what is happening is we are doing dynamic linking. So, the program is actually loading the library on the fly and in fact, it is possible for a program to load multiple libraries, which can all exist at the same time in the program. Um, so, this first step has um, basically just loaded the drivers. The next step is actually opening a connection. Now, if you look here, you have a URL, 
just like a HTTP colon slash slash, we are saying JDBC colon Oracle colon thin and so on. Now, this is in, you know, the driver manager basically figures out from this that it has to use the Oracle driver. If you use a different thing here, if you loaded two drivers, one for Oracle, one for PostgreSQL at the same time, you can do that. Then, depending on this, it will use the appropriate driver, depending on what you specify here. So, in this case, um, it says at db.el.edu, that is the machine host name, colon 2000 is the port number, colon univdb is the database on that server. The server is running on, on that server, on that port number, Oracle is running and Oracle supports multiple databases. So, we are saying uh, use the univdb and finally, authenticate yourself using the user ID and password passed in here. So, that opens a connection to the database, this login session. Then, we create a statement. So, on the connection, we create a statement and then the actual work is on the subsequent slide, too big to fit in one slide. When you are done with the actual work, you have to close the statement, close the connection. Uh, note, it is important to close both of these. Those familiar with Java uh, would know about garbage collection in Java. You know, you can create objects and then forget about them, they get garbage collected quietly. Unfortunately, connections do not get garbage collected quietly. What happens is, um, they just hang around and when you are testing a small program, it seems to work fine and then when lot of users use it, the database runs out of connections. There are too many open connections. So, do not forget to close the statement and the connection at the end of whatever you are doing. Okay, so, that this whole thing is within a try catch and the, uh, these things, the only exception that they can generate in this case is the SQL exception. So, you can catch it and output whatever. So, what are the exceptions which could arise here? There are many possible exceptions. One is, it could not connect to the database. The database is not running. Another, we have not shown it here, but the actual SQL statements can have an exception. I try to insert into a relation, primary key violation, SQL exception. So, all of those exceptions are thrown in here and caught here and this just prints out the message. So, you know what happened. So, what is the body of the code? Well, um, this one is any of these could be in the body. So, the first one is updating the database. So, we have already opened the statement object which you saw here, stmt is connection dot create statement. So, on that object, we can say execute update and then give a query string and it is going to submit this SQL string to the database, run it there and again it can have an exception. So, in this case, we catch the exception here and print it out right here saying we could not insert the tuple or it could be a query in which case uh, again we are not shown the try catch here, but even a query could run into trouble. What kind of trouble could a query run into? Why would a query not execute? There are many possible things. The, it could be a syntax error. It could be syntactically correct, but you do not have authorization to that table. So, there could be many reasons why this fails and they would all result in an exception. But assuming everything works fine, this query is executed in the database and the result is passed back as a result set object. Now, what is this result set object? It is basically, it encapsulates the entire result. Um, conceptually, if it is a very large result, the driver could fetch it in pieces, uh, but practically I think most of the common drivers fetch the whole result up front and it can get you into trouble if it is a very large result. Um, but let us ignore that for the moment. So, what you can do then is a step through the tuples in the result, there could be many uh, records in the result. So, r set dot next steps through tuples and it returns false when there are no more tuples. So, here as long as it is true, what are we doing here? We are printing get string department name that is there and r set dot get float 2. Why did we do 2? Because there is a second attribute of the result. Now, note that this does not have a name, AVG of salary, 
has some internal name which is system dependent, we do not know what it is. We could have said as and given it a name and then fetch that name, use that name here, but you can use positional notation also. Note also that whether to get string or get float is a decision we are making in the program here. It is possible that you know, I um, will say get string on 2, what happens? As long as it can be typecast, so you can always convert a float to a string. So, it will give you back that string if I say get string 2. On the other hand, if I do get float of department name, what will happen? That department name is not a number, it will give you an exception at that point. Okay. So, as long as these are type safe, we will step through all the rows of the result and print all of them. So, that is all this program does. Any questions? So, these two are equivalent, get string department name and get string 1, because this is the first attribute. Uh, how about null values? When I say get string, I am getting a string back. If that initial input was null, I could get a null object perhaps, but what if I… Instead of that uh, column name, can hmm. we use the uh, position of 0, 1, 2, 3? That is what we have done there, get string 1, that is the position, first, second, third. No, it starts from 1, not 0. Okay. So, now, um, one of the differences between the SQL type system and uh, Java or any other programming language type system is that SQL supports nulls for every possible type. In a language like Java, if you have an object, a pointer or a reference to an object, the null value is a special value. But if you have an int, a primitive int, there is no way to represent a null value there. So, when you get data from SQL to Java, you have to do a bit of work. So, you could always say get int a, um, this is not for the previous query, so something else, let us say it is an integer. If it was a null value, what is the result you get here? It is something system defined, we do not know what it is, maybe minus max int maybe 0, I do not know. However, what I can do is, I can say r s dot was null. So, the last action I did on that result set, whatever it was, get int, get string, whatever is the last thing I got, was null tells me if that was null. So, whatever the value is saved here, uh, I, if, it, if this is true, I can ignore that and treat it as null. Okay. So, all of this is to deal with the difference between the type system, the a the null value, b the fact that SQL deals with relations, whereas Java deals with individual uh, records. Now, um, we saw a query here, before I get to that, um, we saw a query here, which was executed. You can always pass a query string. Now, if you have any input which you are getting from the user, you have to be very careful with this. How many of you have heard of uh, SQL injection attacks? Few of you, mm, most of you have. How many of you have not heard of SQL injection? Okay, good. You will be hearing about it in the next couple of slides. So, uh, how many of you have used something like this, where you take a string and pass it to a database and execute it? Quite a few have done this. And if you got a value from the user, you probably just concatenated the string and then passed it into the database. This seems like a reasonable thing to do. Uh, what can go wrong? Well, I will show you in a moment. So, first I will show you the right way of doing it. The right way of doing it is whenever you get parameters from the user, in this case actually they are not from the user, they are fixed values, uh, but uh, this still illustrates the syntax. In this case, there is an insert statement, but it could be any statement, it could be a query. Um, instead of execute query, what I am going to do is connection dot prepare statement. Uh, what this is going to do is going to take a string which has question marks for values which are going to be provided subsequently. And these could be values which are input from the user. So, whatever is the value which is input from the user, the only way to pass it to the database is by first 
taking the rest of the query with question marks for as placeholders for those values, preparing a statement and then you can put those values in. In this case, the values are fixed uh, 888777, Perry Finance uh, and salary of uh, 125,000. So, I am setting all these values, set int on this, set int 1 to this, 2 is the second question mark, 3 is the third one, 4 is the fourth question mark. I have provided values for all four question marks and finally, I can do a statement dot execute update because this is an update. If it were a query, I would have done execute query similarly. So, what is the benefit of doing this? Um, we are going to see this next. What it, this is the way to do it. Why should you do it this way? We will see in just a moment. Um, but before that, uh, note that what we have done here, we can actually reset one of the values. So, in this case, we have made the first question mark, we have changed it to 88878 8, 8, instead of 77 7, and then we have done an execute update. What does this do? It creates one more instructor with a new ID, but since we did not set 234, it just takes the old value, it reuses those. Okay. So, now, uh, what is wrong with concatenating strings? Uh, the alternative would have been to do something like this, which I am sure many people have done insert into instructor values single quote and the double quote closes the Java string. The single quote is for SQL plus ID, which we have read from somewhere plus single quote comma single quote that is um, plus the name and so on. So, we have constructed a string and SQL query by explicitly including single quotes over here, but it is very dangerous. What if somebody's name was D'Souza with a apostrophe there? What is going to happen? This name here, D, that quote will finish the name. So, now the name is D and what is after that? S O U Z A, which is not a value, it is uh, there is no comma even that should have been a comma. So, what will happen is you will get a syntax error in this case and you should be very happy you get only a syntax error here because you can <laughs> things can be much, much worse. Okay. So, uh, in the early days uh, before we realized the need for prepared statements, I mean all of us have gone through this. Um, we had programs written here long back uh, which did this and guess what? They failed on D'Souza. This example is real. Um, they failed on uh, Father Agnell's college. Any of you are from Bombay? Anyway, you there is a uh, in our uh, MTech uh, records, we keep track of where people did their uh, BE, BTech. And we found out after uh, I think a year of this application running that we had a lot of garbage there. Wherever Father Agnell's college was coming in, <laughs> there was garbage. <laughs> Nothing was, all the remaining fields were gone. Okay. So, you should not be constructing it like this. The right way to have done it would have been to use an escape character, so that the quote in D'Souza is not interpreted as a string terminating quote in SQL. Backslash quote should have been used. Now, if you knew this and you were careful, you could have done it, but why take all the trouble when this guy will do all of that for you. So, in the prepared statement, when I say set string, if this string happened to have a quote, set string will do the job for you. It will put in a backslash, so that the quote is not treated as a SQL special character, it is treated as part of the string. Okay. So, that is one reason why you should use prepared statement. You should never concatenate strings like this. It is a terrible idea. Well, I said it gets worse. What if somebody clever knew that you had a bug like this? Let us see what all they could do. Um, so, select uh, star from instructor where name equal to the name which was typed in. So, the user could type x quote or quote y equal to single quote y. Note that the last quote is not typed in, that is provided here. So, this query which was supposed to take a name and print 
the name of uh, print the information of that instructor, what is it done instead? It says a name equal to x or y equal to y which is true. So, it is going to print the name of all instructors. So, the query was supposed to print just this one name, but you have this clever user has modified the query and is running a different query from what the system implementer intended to run. Now, is that so bad? Well, in this case, it has not done anything drastic, but it could get worse. Um, the user could have done this x quote semicolon update instructor set salary equal to salary plus 10,000 semicolon and then dash dash. Now, why this dash dash? That is an SQL comment. What it ensures is the, this quote will go into a comment. So, now you have a valid SQL statement, actually two part statement, one of which is a select and the other is an update. Now, if the database accepted this as is and executed it, many databases do, you can instead of giving a single statement, you can give a set of statements and it will execute all of them. So, what is going to happen? It is going to run some query whose result is irrelevant and then give everybody a salary increase. Of course, if we get a salary increase, we would be happy, <laughs> but equally well, this person could have said uh, delete from instructor and deleted all of us. Okay. So, basically a hacker can do anything they want to the database through this loophole and it is shockingly easy. They just have to connect to your application, type one quote and then type whatever they want and it, this string goes and gets executed. It is like you know a big hole, you are just waiting to be kicked. And unfortunately, many, many applications out there have this bug, SQL injection bug. This bug is called the SQL injection bug because what your hacker is able to do is actually enter a SQL statement which the database is going to execute on, on their behalf and they can do anything they want to the database. Any questions on this? So, how many of you have ever written an application which has the SQL injection bug? No? I have. I will admit to it. Anybody else? The rest of you have not written any application? <laughs> okay. That is the only way you have not create you, you know written an application in this bug. <laughs> Is there anybody here who has written an application, but not ever made this mistake? No one. Okay. So, I, I want to spread the awareness of this, because this is a really dangerous thing and unfortunately exceedingly common. So, you should make sure your students never make this mistake. So, make sure you communicate this. Okay. So, let us uh, then wrap up with JDBC quickly and I am going to stop there for today um, and get back to the lab. Uh, as I said, there are metadata features. There are two kinds of metadata features. One is to get oops, information about the result set for a query and the other is to get uh, database metadata, which is uh, schema information primary key, foreign key, all kinds of information on the database schema itself. So, I am going to skip the details of both of these, but go read up uh, these things. And um, for I think, yeah, the final thing in JDBC is something which I mentioned uh, before lunch, uh, which is uh, connection dot set auto commit to false will turn off auto commit. So, then all the statements which you submit subsequently on that connection will all be part of one transaction. They will not get committed automatically. And finally, you can say connection dot commit or connection dot rollback depending on what you want to do. Why would you do connection dot rollback? Because you did multiple updates and you realize there is a problem and then you cannot go forward. So, then you roll back which undoes all the updates, but that is going to be rare. Very rarely do you need to roll back. The more important use for it is what if there is a power failure in the middle? If you did two or three updates separately, it is possible that the first few updates got saved in the database. The remaining 
before you even did it, power failed. So, what has happened is the database is in an inconsistent state. If you are familiar with transactions, you know this. That is the real problem or the more common problem and this will prevent that from happening by treating all of those as a transaction. Okay, um, so, I will just stop the chapter pretty much here. There is a bit on ODBC which is similar to JDBC, ADO.NET which is also similar to ODBC. This is syntax varies. And then there is embedded SQL which is again a variant. Um, which is more tightly integrated with the programming language. So, there are a couple of things. There is an, a Java embedding of SQL called SQLJ. Again, I am not getting into details. Uh, th that is it for the communication from a programming language to a database. Uh, the chapter has a bit more of stuff on a uh, couple of things. One is stored procedures, then there is triggers and I will cover this uh, maybe tomorrow I will do this. Okay, so any questions on uh, what we covered today?